everyone. Welcome back to Hair of the Werewolf. I'm Lily, and I have with me Chase. What's up? And we are a paranormal horror podcast that likes telling each other scary stories, all while we have delicious, delicious drinks. Only today, <laughs> it's a little bit special, because this is a morning episode. Well, I, mean, I don't know if you're listening to it in the morning, but we're recording it in the morning, so we're not drinking alcohol. We're drinking no. <laughs> coffee and tea, so we're just, you know... Getting into the mode and relaxing. Yeah, I'm trying to wake up still. I'm not a morning person. So this is very different for me. Um, we typically try not to record on the same day we release the episode, but we're doing it. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, unforeseen things got in the way, but we're making this happen. We're not going to yeah. miss an episode. So boom. Yeah, we're going to force it, even if it's a little late. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have some announcements this morning. Let's see if I can recall any of them. Well, we last week we mentioned it. It got released, I think, on Tuesday or Wednesday. You and me were guests on another podcast called Dead Letter Movies, and you can find their podcast on various services or just go to deadlettermovies.com. It's a podcast that talks about movies, all sorts mm-hmm. of movies. They like doing Oscar predictions and new release reviews and, and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, they cover bizarre movies, awkward movies, and popular movies all over the place. It's hosted by Andrew and Tim. Uh, I used to live with Andrew way back in college, so uh, got a whole movie debate history with him that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, in the, On this episode, we talk about the most recently released Conjuring 3. Yep. It was really fun. I actually had a good time uh, just having a good conversation about the movie. I don't really get to talk about it a whole lot. I mean, I do with you, mm. but um, I don't know, especially with like newer movies. Sometimes it's hard for you know friends to get out there and watch the movies when they first come out, especially now, of course, because of the pandemic. But that was really refreshing. We hadn't seen a good movie or rather a movie in theaters for a very long time. Not since Zombieland 2. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so this, it was, a, it was a great experience. The first half of the episode is spoiler free. Mm-hmm. And then we do a spoiler discussion at the end, but they do preface when that spoilers, when the spoilers begin. So if you're interested in hearing, you know, what we thought of the movie without ruining it, at least the first half of the episode is for you. And there's a good warning. So if you're interested, you guys should go over to their website, check it out. Otherwise, this if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. That episode, the subject matter Conjuring 3, is kind of relevant for today, isn't it? It is. I will be doing the true story of The Devil Made Me Do It. It's uh, basically the story of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson. So for any of you who haven't seen The Conjuring 3 yet but want to, um, we're not going to be talking about the movie pretty much. No, no, no. So you could argue that there aren't going to be any spoilers, but we are going to talk about some of the events it's based on. So, you know, the movie obviously is going to do its own thing, take liberties of the story and everything like that. But if you're super worried about it ruining anything, then maybe you want to wait until after you've seen the movie. But yeah, like if you truly don't know anything about it already and you're like, I want to be completely surprised, even if some of the information has changed in the movie then maybe uh, wait until you see the movie and then listen to this episode. But otherwise, it's going to be pretty different. Um, yeah, I can promise. You know, <laughs> seen the movie, it does a lot of its. It does most of yeah, it is it its does own its, thing. It's movie thing. It's like based on a true story. It's like, yeah, I guess there was a guy named Arnie. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, anyway, that's yeah. just a heads up. Right. So. Exactly. So, dun dun. Are we ready? We... Uh, I think we should dive right into it you okay know. let's do this let me do this all right as i already spoiled it uh i am doing the story of the devil made me do it uh let me i think i'm gonna give a first te- not a teaser but start out with this fact the true story of arnie cheyenne johnson um who would go on to commit the first murder in brookfield connecticut he would then go on to be the first person to use a defense that he was possessed by a demon and had no control over his actions. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, you know what? I'm not sure what's harder to believe. Okay. <laughs> that he that he's claiming that he was possessed and that's what made him do it, or that it was the only murder in this like town's history. I mean like as far as since the town was established, I mean, I mean did a I guy like, die there once? Maybe, but not since it was Brookfield. Uh, yeah, as someone who likes to think of himself as an optimist, though as every year goes by, that's, that goes away. Um, 
people are still people. And <laughs> if you have, I mean, unless there's only like two people living in this town. I mean, it was There's a small, still a chance murder could happen. It's a small town. I don't know. That's just what I've read. And it was in the newspaper and everything. So it wasn't like this one guy decided this was the first murder or anything. Um, so let's start from the beginning. All right. Um, actually, the story does not start with Arnie Johnson. No, it actually starts with an 11-year-old boy named David Glatzel. In 1981... David Glatzel's family purchased a rental home in Connecticut so that Debbie, and uh, which is David's older sister, and her boyfriend, Arnie Johnson, would live in. So that's where the connection is with Arnie and then this boy. One day, while the Glatzel family was at the rental property cleaning, David was alone upstairs in one of the bedrooms where he was working. When out of nowhere, he felt someone push him from behind. David turned around and saw a very tall old man standing in the room. Looming over David, the old man warned him that if he and his family moved into the home, that he would harm them. Then he disappeared. David immediately left the room to tell his parents what happened, and not surprisingly, no one believed him. In fact, they all thought he made it up uh, so that he can get out of cleaning, which I guess is kind of like, okay, stop. Uh, (laughs) You have to clean. (laughs) I mean, you can kind of imagine it, too. If a kid says that, you're like, okay, this kid's story is lame because... You know, what kid says, I just got bullied by an old man. But what a wild story. Could you just, like, said, ow, I hurt my foot? I mean, I feel like either he's just very clever at lying or I don't <laughs> My know. tummy hurts. I can't <laughs> clean. No, yeah. he's like, so an old man ghost just said, don't move in here. We're all going to die. And yeah. they're like, stop this. <laughs> clean. Clean your room. Yeah. Oh, David. Um, well, true to his word, the old man continued to torment David. The family never experienced anything themselves, except that sometimes they would hear strange noises coming from the attic. Unfortunately for David, the threats increased and the old man would tell him that he was going to take his soul and murder his family. After that, David started to have night terrors. Bruises and scratches would suddenly appear on his body and he was beginning to exhibit very strange behavior. Okay, that is weird. Yeah. Mm Mm-mm. On top of that, David also claimed that the old man began to change his form, too. He described him as having uh, black eyes, a thin face, jagged teeth, and other animal-like features like horns and hooves. As time... (laughs) Yeah, I know. I'm like, uh, hold up. Now, I think we're straight up just describing the devil, I think, right? Until you got to the horns and hooves, I'm like, why am I imagining, like, a grody rock star? I'm like... (laughs) Yeah, he's just like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, Horn and Susan, like, oh. It's just Ozzy Osbourne. He's like, I'm, I'm just a lost old man. Could you please direct me back home? <laughs> Some one of his benders. Yeah. He shows up at this kid's house. He's like, why'd you say that to the kid? He's like, I don't know. He's like, oh, shoot. Again. I was, I was drunk. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. At some point, David described the old man as having charred skin and slowly losing all human qualities. So it was constantly changing itself as well. The entity would eventually be referred to as the Beast. You know, I do <laughs> I do enjoy whenever they refer to the devil as the Beast. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it does send chills. Because like, I hear the word devil and Satan, you know, I mean... Growing up Christian, you hear him so often, you're just right. like, okay, it's just other words. But when you hear someone say, that's the mark of the beast, all of a sudden <laughs> I get this like little chill. I'm like, ooh, this, now it seems a little bit scary. Yeah, it just seems very just surreal because a beast, I mean, I think you can think of an animal, but it's just this, such a vague word for something vicious and, and animalistic. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, yes, yeah, so the beast was his name. David also became violent towards his family. The mother said, he, quote, he spit at me, kicked me, squeezed me in the bust, end quote. This situation continued to escalate to the point where the family would sleep during the day and then stay up all night with David. The family said that they knew when David was transforming into the beast because he would lower his head to his chest and then slowly lift his head back up only to reveal distorted features. His eyes would be white, and he'd begin to snarl like an animal. He also started to suffer from violent spasms and convulsions to the point where the family members had to hold him down. So, just going to say, I think this is because we're in the early 80s that people are (laughs) like, he might be seeing demons and possessed, whereas I have a feeling 
if this was happening now, mm-hmm. people would say, oh, he just has epilepsy and ADD. Give him some Ritalin. <laughs> yeah, just give him whatever drugs you need to give him. Although it was kind of strange that as these things were happening to him, they were only coming at night. And as far as I know, seizures don't give a F if the sun is out or not. That's true. Uh, I, I'm assuming. I don't know if there are episodes. I know, like, uh, we had we had people that we knew in our lives who would have um, seizures and only one friend in particular who had very severe epilepsy. But, yeah, so I remember her saying that it was sometimes induced through stress. So unless the night was stressing him out because he was afraid of his hallucinations, that would make mm-hmm. sense. Otherwise, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Knows? There's a so many different types of epilepsy so yeah exactly and it's dif- very difficult to diagnose to begin Absolutely. with and then just to even know what to do with it after it's been diagnosed it's very limited but i think we're going with the idea that uh this wasn't the epilepsy yeah he, i'm guessing well who, yeah he's having beast visits he's having beast visits, and then also there's like a lot of uh this description of him changing his look as far as i know people who have a seizure don't really change the way they look they just kind of um, pass out have their episode or and, they, then, they and, then, and then come and to weird. usually foaming well, at the mouth things like that right but they're usually not talking Absolutely or like not. you know standing up or anything like that so that this is what makes this situation a little unique well and the eyes going white i don't think that happens unless unless he was like looking like you know his eyes rolling back his eyes and they back. couldn't see even you usually even see part of the iris at the top or something unless so. he's squinting maybe i mean who knows who knows so that's a little creepy it i see a little creepy. kid who like <laughs> Start speaking weird and his eyes are white. I'm I'm done babysitting. Yeah, so it's like know. ooh, yeah. You know what? It's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stay poor. Um, so yeah, David's parents finally decided to call a priest to come bless the house, but it didn't help at all. David's situation only continued to get worse. Only 12 days after the first encounter with the old man, David had begun to see the evil entities during the day. His health was deteriorating more each day as well. The family finally reached out to Ed and Lorraine Warren. I also found out that the mother, Judy Glatzel, had attended a few of the Warrens' lectures regarding possession and other paranormal subject matters. Uh, Debbie and Judy, so Debbie the sister and Judy the mother, were big fans and truly believed that they were the only people that could help David. So I don't know if this is going to add to what will happen next for context as far as like them believing everything that the Warrens had to say or that um or they really had more credit so it really depends on how you want to interpret the situation we should we should also preface to all people out there who their familiarity with the Warrens is through the conjuring movies yeah it cannot be overstated Mm -hmm. that the real and lorraine warren were very different people of course, uh, they were yeah. nothing like the actors, uh, actor and actress who portray them in the movie. Who do, they do how them, they were written? They right? are amazing characters in the movie. They're very kind, very nice. Very few people have nice things to say about the Warrens in real life. So <laughs> try not to imagine those people because it's a very different scenario. Yeah, for sure. And I was actually going to go into and talk about just a super brief. Uh, description of who Ed and Lorraine Warren Perfect. were. Perfect for people who have never seen who've them. Never, That's awesome. Who've never seen them or may have forgotten. I mean, uh, some people saw The Conjuring, the first one, and then just completely forgot, which is kind of when they're provided a proper description of who, an introduction, I should say. So Ed and Lorraine Warren are a paranormal investigating duo, is how I'd like to think of them. Ed, who um, has now passed in 2006, he was 79 years old, He was described as a self-taught demonologist. Lorraine, who died in 2019 at 92 years old, was a medium and a clairvoyant. Uh, Reminder, a clairvoyant is when a person is able to gain information from objects, people, location, or other physical events. And a medium is when someone can literally mediate between the living and the dead. They are uh, like a vessel that is used to communicate between the two worlds. And so those are pretty powerful abilities yeah exactly (laughs) and so together they made a pretty good team considering or hoping that all of this information is true in 1952 they founded the new england society of psychic research which is also the oldest ghost hunting group in new england they have claimed to have investigated over 10,000 cases including some of the most popular cases like the amityville haunting the annabelle doll enfield poltergeist and of course the case of arnie johnson which we will get into a little later 
And if you really are unfamiliar with either Ed or Lorraine Warren, mm-hmm. um, they're easy to find information about because they are arguably the most famous mm-hmm. paranormal investigators in history. Yeah, so when Lorraine first entered the home after they've been contacted and they agreed to come out to a visit with the family, Lorraine said that as soon as she looked at over at David, she could see a black mist hovering next to him. Mm. Yeah. She knew immediately that whatever was latching onto David, it was evil and would be very difficult to exercise. Lorraine would later reveal that David was not only possessed by the beast, but also by 43 demons. <laughs> 43, uh, yeah. huh? Did she count them? I don't, I guess, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's a lot of names or or people to even recognize when I'm in a room. I, if, if I was in a room with 43 people, I'd be like, I don't know, there's like 50, 30 here. I, you know, it's hard for me to like really observe. But. <laughs> you know me, I super <laughs> over exaggerate. You do. If I see even like just 20 people in a room, I'm like, man, there's like 100 people it was like, here. It was the biggest part I've ever been to. <laughs> I can't help it. Like once, once I think I get over like five people, I'm like, God, there's so many people. Yeah, it's like, how do I keep track of this? <laughs> they should leave. They should all have like names so I can like name know tags. who they are. Yeah. So these demons, I doubt had any name tags, and so it was very <laughs> difficult. Once I, I, hello, my name is the Beast. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he took the best name. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that is how, or that's what she counted, and. That's that's just what she determined in the end. Anyway, during the interviews. <laughs> so I still can't get over the name tags. It's like, oh, he's the beast for you. It's like, my name's Bill, and I like to party. <laughs> <laughs> the party demon. Perfect. Um, so, yeah. So during interviews, the Warrens said that the family shared uh, terrifying details that they themselves would later witness as well such as seeing David get beaten and choked by invisible hands and then later seeing the red marks appear around his neck. He would also growl, hiss, speak in different voices that seemed unnatural, speaking in different tongues, and recite passages from the Bible and Paradise Lost, a book of poems that talks about Christian mythology. I had to look it up. I honestly didn't know what Paradise Lost was when I first... Really? I don't know. I think I, like... You know, sometimes there's just information that seems to, like, not ever get into your head. And then when you look it up, you're like, this has probably have been around, you know, referred to a million times. And oh, I just, yeah. and for some reason, I just never it's caught su- on. It's super famous. No, I know it is. And I, when I looked it up, I felt like an idiot. And I'm like, I guess I knew about it. But I, but when I read it, I was like, what the hell is that? Anyway, now I'm embarrassed. Okay. <laughs> So the family confirmed that they had no idea how he would know any of this information and uh, of just like what he was reciting and and what he was um, saying back, especially just for an 11 year old in general, this would have been advanced information just like and and the parents like knowing him, I guess they would know if he was constantly reading the Bible or anything like that, but it didn't seem like that was the case. On top of this, the Warrens also observed that the boy had developed great strength. At this point, it was taking up to four adults to hold him down. Damn. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. With all this information, um, I don't know. You can definitely start to see, and it's only been 12 days, by the way, since David that first said about the old man. Um, Yeah. In 12 days, the family was completely emotionally and physically fatigued. And, uh, And David, of course, having it the worst, never sleeping. So I can only imagine their situation. I don't know how you want to interpret it but it could either be that they're more susceptible to suggestion maybe they're like exhausted they're not even sure what to do anymore and they're allowing all these people media and etc to enter their lives well i guess yeah when you're desperate at some point you're like oh i'll try anything yeah exactly so after assessing david's situation the warrants felt it would be best that he receive three quote lesser exorcism instead of one prolonged session. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe... I didn't know... I I know you could break up meals throughout the day, but I didn't know it's like... (laughs) Just start with a tiny light exorcism in the morning. And then have a really light exorcism at night. Yeah. Yeah. But a big one in the middle. Right, right. You really want to get your fill. Extra fries. (laughs) Extra demon. So the... I would say that like... 
I, when I read this, I didn't understand, and I really couldn't find a lot of information for their reasoning, except that maybe um, he would have been too weak to go for a prolonged session, and they were trying to break them up. So in the end, maybe they would have had the same effect. But is there... I mean, I don't know if there's an exorcism rule book. Is that even just allowed? I don't know. I mean, I'm not the demonologist. I'll tell you that now. So, um, yeah. So during these exorcism, David was overseen by six different priests and the Warrens. Also uh, present during the exorcism, exorcism, aside from David's family, was Arnie Johnson. Everyone witnessed David levitate, stop breathing for long periods of time, become very violent, and even attempted to attack his mother and grandmother with a knife. Lastly, <laughs> yeah. You know, just something that you do. You know, I mean, you have a light exorcism, and then all of a sudden you got a knife in your hand. Yeah, who, how did he who get thought? a knife? Why is there a knife near him during an exorcism? <laughs> oh, They're my like, God, that's a really good question. Time for the light exorcism. Make sure he's got his knife. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just secure this. The, I mean, they didn't even baby-proof the room. I mean, those are just basic things, but who knows? David also predicted that a murder would take place soon. Mm. Yeah. So as I had just mentioned, Arnie was present during the exorcism, and sometimes during David's exorcism, Arnie began to talk to the demon, demanding that it leave David alone, threatening it and telling it, quote, I'll fight you, end quote, and then later saying, quote, come into me, end quote. The Warrens attempted to stop Arnie from talking to the demons, but it was too late. In response, David began to smile during Arnie's threats and said, quote, they're laughing at you, end quote. That is one creepy child. <laughs> well, it also means Arnie's an idiot. Well, I mean, I don't know what his reasoning, maybe he just felt so sad and was like, take me instead. But they were kind of working on helping David already. Yeah, they, so, were, they had a solution that they yeah, were working on. Let he, that ride out first, you know? <laughs> exactly. Just see if this actually goes somewhere because, right. I mean, you'd think that it, if they said they saw the kid levitate, mm -hmm. you'd think this guy sees someone levitate and goes, this might be beyond my understanding. <laughs> but he's like, no, 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 no. Kids levitating, I want to do that. Come into me. Yeah. I, I don't know. He's just like being brazen, uh, just trying to, who knows? Because at this point, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Arnie was around 18 or 19 years old. Uh, I'm not sure when his birthday is, so that could have been either one. He was younger than his girlfriend by a significant amount, I think. Actually. I think, I think, he think was she was in her 20s. Younger, but I don't remember how much. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I wrote that down. Um, so, going back to that, uh, Lorraine knew at that moment that Arnie was in danger. She said, quote, he never realized there were so many demons in the boy, end quote. On the same night, Lorraine contacted the local police to tell them that there will be a tragedy at the Glatzel home and to be aware of the situation. So she was trying to put it out there. She herself also started predicting that uh, that it's not going to end well uh, for this family. Maybe the uh, maybe the small portion of exorcisms weren't, weren't going to be effective. They should have just done the big one. Yeah, th maybe they're just being lazy. Because <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken, exorcism can take days without rest. So it's a very exhausting process. Yeah, I hope I never, ever have to see, let alone experience one. No, right. Um, <laughs> Let's hope not. I mean, who knows? Yeah, they're always intense in movies, but the ones in movies, let's be honest, only last short period of time well, except right, for the they, movie they The show. Exorcist which was like most of the movie the whole movie yeah um, but still not days long if I would just say what I know little about exorcism it's not an easy process it's it's exhausting for the people who are who are presenting it or, or executing it and of course the person that's receiving it and um, and yeah so I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot more about that there are many 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 other possession stories out there that I'm sure I'll cover at some point so that should be fun yeah. So Debbie, Arnie's girlfriend slash David's sister, said that Arnie began to exhibit strange behavior the following day from his threats. Oh, man, yeah. right quick. That was, that was a quick demon or 43 demons. Who knows which one? She said that Arnie would stare out the window for long periods of time and say things like, quote, there he is, the beast, there he is, end quote. Arnie also began to growl and expose his teeth like an animal. Afraid, Debbie would slap David in an attempt to get him out of the trance because she knew at this point things were only going to get worse 
seeing of what happened to her brother. It's like the worst version of like someone in your family has like the flu and then someone <laughs> else starts to get it. You're like, oh, I know where this is going. Oh, I know. But it's a, it's a demon. Yeah, that would suck. Because you know you're next probably or something. You're like, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> what can I do? It's like, just leave home. Just, yeah. A pan in just your family. Go. Right. <laughs> a pan in your family. <laughs> You're good. Wait, solution. was that selfish? No. <laughs> okay, I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> I ain't levitating. I'm out. Yeah. Um, so a few days later, as David's condition improved, Arnie's began to get worse. While Arnie was driving, he claimed that the demon took control of the car and rammed it against a tree. Luckily, Arnie was unharmed. I'm sorry, the first time I read this, I was like, it was this is the opposite of Jesus take the wheel. It was like demon forced wheel you die now right yeah i I don't know it was (laughs) hope you can drive stick yeah (laughs) demon's like well who cares (laughs) um arnie also began getting up at night and break furniture during violent fits there was also a time uh i guess while they were attending church arnie got up from his seat and began to spout obscenities and scream that he wanted to leave Mm. yeah so it's getting a little public here. I mean, would you have taken... I wouldn't have taken Arnie to the church, but maybe they thought that would help. I don't know. Uh, Debbie also revealed during interviews that she would sometimes hear two awful-sounding voices coming from Arnie's mouth at the same time, something she's never heard him do before. So who knows? So, I mean, unless he practiced that skill set ahead of time, this is supposed to be uh, very creepy weird. and unsettling. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's like if I if I started reciting things from the Bible or apparently this book that I never heard of, that would be really strange. Hearing two voices, that's, that's I don't know, a physical s- thing that you can't just do, right? Like, I don't think it's something that it's easy to do. I can't imagine. Well, I did see a YouTube video once of someone who allegedly could do two voices at once. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to be a famous example. I think the video, if I remember correctly, it was a pretty old video. Like, it was from, like, the 90s or something. And I was listening to it. I'm like, is that what's happening here? It just sounded weird. And I, I don't oh. think it sounded like I was listening to two voices at once. And so... Was it just more like... I just picture it being like more of a vibrating kind it, of thing. One was kind of like weird and high-pitched. Mm-hmm. And the other one was kind of like deep. And it was kind of like a really weird ventriloquist thing going on. Okay. It was supposed to be a learned skill. Oh, yeah. I didn't think it sounded like two voices. It just sounded like something weird was going on with someone's vocal cords. Yeah. So, and I I doubt that's what this person heard. I I bet they really were hearing two different voices. Two different voices, uh, doing two different things. And um, I don't know if she was referring to, like, them talking or anything like that. But if someone hadn't heard or even knew really about that set of skills of the two voices at the same time, and then you just heard it, someone do it. I think it would have had to have been done well for you to distinguish that there were two voices. Does that make sense? Exactly. Yeah. I I think that's kind of, yeah, that's where my mind's at with it too. Yeah. That's what I thought of, but who knows? So as Arnie's situation was getting worse, Arnie decided to confront the beast again. So he's pretty stubborn. During David's possession, David allegedly said that the well that was outside the rental home was where the demons were coming from claiming it was some sort of portal or something like that. So that's when Arnie decided to go and face them. He went to the well. Arnie described the experience as terrifying. He said that he stared into the demon's eyes and began to feel himself fall into a trance. Mm. Yeah, so it did not go well. I don't know what he was expecting, but usually demons are not going to be very nice uh, when you confront them, especially. Sounds like he needs to find someone bigger and older than him and get them to take the demon on. Yeah, God. Wait, won't you fight this for me? <laughs> yeah. Um, pick on someone your own size, please. <laughs> you put an advertisement on Craigslist. <laughs> Need someone to take a demon, please. We'll pay money. We'll pay. Thanks. So during this time, uh, Arnie and Debbie had been living in an apartment um, that was above a dog grooming place where Debbie worked. In addition, Debbie's boss, Alan Bono, uh, who was 40 years old, was also their landlord. The three had a good relationship and hung out together many times. I have to mention that because what happens next isn't so nice. On February 16th, 1981, 
Arnie had called in sick from work at Wright Tree Service because he wanted to spend the day with Debbie. Um, He was a tree surgeon. I didn't know that's what you called them, but they're the people who cut down trees that are dead or you just want to trim them down. Yeah, I never, I never call them tree surgeons, but I, I mean, I know the job. Yeah, I know it too. And when I heard it, I was like, I guess, oh, I, I just never knew what the title was. So he wasn't really sick. He was taking a mental health day. He was taking a mental health day, yes. To hang out with his lady. <laughs> right. At their apartment, Arnie's little sister and Debbie's nine-year-old cousin joined them. At one point, Alan, the landlord, offered to buy the group lunch at a local bar. As they ate, Alan began to drink heavily. By the time they got home, he was pretty much wasted. Debbie knew the situation was going to get bad, so she told the girls to leave the apartment, but before the nine-year-old girl could reach the door, Alan grabbed her by the arm hard and wouldn't let go. That's creepy. That's super creepy, and so even though what I was reading and the accounts of Debbie and, and, and the cousins and sister or whatever and everyone that was there... They made it seem like they were all really friendly and fun together, but the fact that he was heavily drinking and then they said wasn't, at some point I remember reading that that's not an unusual characteristic of Bono. He's a a mean drunk. And like he could be a mean drunk, so when he got too drunk, uh, Debbie was trying to fix it before it got bad, and I'm like, that's just never a good situation when you have, if she already knew this, this isn't the first time, let me put it that way. So who knows what the real relationship was like. I would also argue... Any time a belligerent drunk grabs a child, yeah. it's never been a good thing. Yeah, what the hell? For sure. So after that happened, um, Arnie argued with Alan to let the girl go. Eventually, Alan did let go of the girl, but the two men continued to argue. Debbie attempted to subdue the situation by standing between the two men, but nothing helped. Witnesses said that Arnie would not budge an inch despite sisters' attempt to pull him away. So I think they were trying to imply that he was displaying some sort of super strength Mm -hmm. uh you know what i'm saying and then arnie began to growl like an animal and act crazy he took out his five inch pocket knife and began to stab alan multiple times in the chest and stomach at around 7 p.m alan was rushed to the hospital but he would later die only a few hours later after the incident so after all this happened Apparently, Arnie was found wandering two miles from the crime scene, and the knife that was used to kill Bono was found along the path. This is how the 19-year-old Arnie Cheyenne Johnson would become the first person to commit a murder in Brookfield, Connecticut. So, if their landlord, I forget his name. It was Alan Bono. Alan, if you're really drunk Mm -hmm. and you get stabbed or something that causes a lot of blood loss, you're usually in a really bad way. Yeah. Your blood's really thin by that so. point. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was going to bleed profusely no matter. I mean, because of his drinking, for sure. That was not going to help. But, you know, he was stabbed four to five times in the chest and stomach. In general, that's very hard to bounce back from anyway. So it really makes me wonder if there was more to more to the scenario, like where he grabbed the kid or did he did he do something more? Did he say something more? Did he imply like. Was this super nefarious or... So this... I I will get into that a little more. But I did want to say... So how do you spell Bono? Uh, I I think the U2... Like the U2 leads Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's B-O-N-O. So that's how it's spelled here. But every time I heard someone say it, they said Bono. I think you... I mean, it really depends. Uh, Okay. I thought... I I, I mean, you know how last names are. Um, Yeah, right. It can be spelled two ways, but like if someone says, this is how you pronounce my last name and someone else does it, you you do it that way. All right. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't saying something wrong. Okay. I mean, I prefer it being called Bono because when I hear Bono, I think of the (laughs) U2 singer and I'm like, there's nothing scary about him except that he has as much money as he does. Yeah. Um... So the day after the murder, Lorraine Warren reached out to the local police to tell them that this was not Arnie's fault because he was possessed. So this could argue that, like, maybe she was the first one to implant this seed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Who mm -hmm. knows? Um, Officers that were involved with the case were later interviewed and asked what they thought about it. And, um, you know, just what, what did they think about the whole situation? Some said they felt uncomfortable that they had never dealt with something like this before and that it made them question their basic religious beliefs. So I don't know. I think maybe they were just spooked. Keep in mind, this was also the first murder, so they were not handled. I mean, this would have been very distressful. First murder. 
Oh, uh, in the region. In the, I was like, I was like, there were more murders. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. There's like, well, I'm sure there have been some after, but sure. this was the first. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the trial now. The trial took place on at Connecticut Superior Court on October 28, 1981. Arnie's defense attorney, Martin Manella, submitted a plea of not guilty due to possession. This is how it made it the first case in the United States to plead not guilty due to demonic possession. The media, of course, freaking loved it. And from that point on, it went on to be known as the devil made me do it case. So I, I have a question. I, yeah. and, and it's because I actually don't know the answer. Sure. I This is after the Amityville horror incident, correct? I believe so, yeah. Because I thought that was in the 70s, right? I thought he claimed that he was possessed too, right? But I think it's this is the first one that was submitted in court. Oh, so he never submitted that in court? As far as I know, I don't think so. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I know that. Okay, okay. So, yeah. So this is the first one that the defense attorney literally was like, this is, this is my defense. plea, or okay. his plea, yeah. Yeah, so Manila had plans to call priests to stand, even if he had to subpoena them. He even traveled to England to meet with the attorneys who had been involved in similar cases. So even though it was the first in the United States, it certainly wasn't the first in the world or anything. Um, huh. Yeah. However, after review, Judge Robert Callahan rejected the defense. He said that this argument would not be allowed in court because it was, quote, irrelevant and unscientific, end quote. So at the last minute, I guess... I don't know whose fault it might have been, but Manila certainly put all his eggs in one basket. So at the very end, he had to switch his plea and kind of prepare for that. And that that would be very difficult to do. So he decided to switch the plea to just self-defense. Uh, the jury was not allowed to consider demonic possessions as a possible defense. So they weren't hmm. so he couldn't present any of that information. Uh, this made certain events difficult to present for sure. But um, he did what he could. The police that were called as witnesses had a very different tone than they did originally when they were interviewed. They said uh, during court that the case was, quote, routine, and it was an open and closed case. Strange choice of words, considering that it was literally their first murder case. How could this be routine? Mm, I don't know. they were coached or something. Something. But then, contradicting those statements, during the trial, the chief of police had a gilded cross hanging in his office saying, quote, I figure, why push your luck, end quote. Woof. Yeah, so I'm like, what is happening? This is like a circus over here. Um, yeah, who knows? Uh, there was a book called The Devil in Connecticut, written by Gerald Brittle and published by the Warrens. Uh, claiming that during the trial, unexplained events occurred, like lights would flicker and some jurors experienced very bad luck. I didn't get a lot of information. I think, I'm sure, like it said, the book had all that info, so I wasn't able to read it or anything, but interesting if you want to believe that. We have, we've had a lot of flickering lights in our house, and I don't think it's (laughs) suspicious lights flicker. Uh, No, especially since you tested the outlet, and it turns out that the electricity in this house is effed up, so. I would say, I would go as far as say slightly dangerous. Slightly dangerous, so we live on the edge here, people. (laughs) Um, So the trial went on about a month, and it took the jury 15 hours over the course of three days before finding Arnie guilty of first-degree manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison on November 24th, 1981. During his time in prison, Arnie and Debbie got married. Arnie earned his high school diploma and took some college courses. He was considered as a model prisoner, which got him sentenced, got his sentence reduced to only five years for good behavior. Wait, wait, wait. Let me get this straight. Okay. <laughs> He was sentenced to 10, you said, right? 10 to 20 years. 10 to 20. Okay. Yeah. But that means they said, oh, our first murder. Sure. 10 years. Right. I want to know, like, what kind of punishments they were giving for anything else happening in this nothing town where only one person has ever died. You know, all I got to say, especially since everyone got their hands on, you know, in the media and talking about the devil and the possessions and, and revealing information that you know, a million interviews from the family, sure. things like that. I'm having a really, really hard time believing that every juror was kept in the dark from all this. And so, yeah, it's I'm hard g- to... you know, it just takes really only a few or one, I think, to to negotiate that sentencing down because they might have truly believed 
he was possessed. Well, I actually, okay, so I have, I have thoughts on that. Normally, I'd agree with you. It's so easy. You know, this is just a few years before we were born. Right. But it's so easy to say, oh, yeah, this happened in the past. And America has, you know, a known history that the further you go back, the more religiously mm-hmm. intense. You know, we were a country founded by Puritan settlers and everything. Like that. It, it makes sense. But the judge said you can't use this mm-hmm. argument because there's no basis in science, which that shocked me in a good way. I oh, was yeah. like, oh, that's awesome. Because that that's even kind of a weird thing to hear nowadays. Because yeah. And so that was pretty cool. So it makes me wonder, I want to know more about this community. Was it a super religious community or was it the kind of community where a judge like that is going to be more, I you're think, like, oh, yeah, totally. I, I mean, just in general, rural America is pretty religious, um, just statistically. But, uh, you know, I don't know. And... Maybe things were slightly different back then. Maybe there was less religious. I I, I don't know. It depends on the region, maybe. We should also make sure we don't ignore the fact that this Arnie guy, Mm -hmm. he did more in prison (laughs) than most people do in 20 years. I just want to say, got married, Uh, did college. By his age? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you know. I mean, seriously, it's one of those things where you're like, man, the prison was a really good thing for you, wasn't it? Yeah, really really settle them down i guess you people come out of prison better than they were beforehand and yeah. i meant in terms of life status life status yeah i was like he got that experience everyone's talking about <laughs> before you get a job um yeah so he was released everything was now good i guess so some of the aftermath that happened after this the warrens made a tv movie that aired on nbc starring kevin bacon the bacon <laughs> called I love Kevin Bacon. The Demon Murder Case. It has a 4.8 out of 10 rating in case you were curious. On IMDb, I assume, right? On IMDb, yeah. Just just remember IMDb, which I love the site, don't get me wrong, it's like helpful. I use it during every movie to find out why I know that one guy <laughs> or girl. Right. Um but I always have to add two points to every single rating because two whole I, points. I think IMDb we're talking like Academy Award Best Picture winners Mm -hmm. still will only have like a Mm 7.4. Oh, well, yeah. And most horror movies in general are really low. So I find that like a 5.0, I would give like a C to. I would agree with you, but there have been times where I saw the rating and it was like a 3.8 and I'm like, wow, I would have given it two points less because, Okay, you're right. It's It's not a perfect scale. I'd say below five it's pretty accurate yeah but yeah. i'd say above five it's usually they're under because underrated i think it's because a lot of people go in there and, and they're just like braveheart this movie was awful zero <laughs> and what? it really and it really hurts like when everyone else is giving it oh, like eight they're and like, you're just like zero the, that really hurts the average the popcorn was stale zero out of ten <laughs> you're like wait a minute dude <laughs> i just found out that the actors weren't actually scottish <laughs> zero <laughs> Yep, that sounds about right. Um, so, yeah, they made a movie, probably tons of money. The book, The Devil in Connecticut, the one that I was talking about, and the Warrens republished in 2006, caused some controversy with the Glatzel family. David's brother, Carl Glatzel, made a statement claiming that the Warrens' interpretation of the incident was a lie and that they were taking advantage of his brother's mental health. The family was upset because the Warrens also told them that they would make millions if they went along with this version of the story. However, the family only received $2,000 after the book was published and never received another cent. Now that sounds like the Warrens that (laughs) I am familiar with. (laughs) Those are the ones I know, yeah. Uh, Later, Carl even went on as far as to sue author Gerald Brittle and the Warrens for financial damages. Brittle, the author, responded by saying that everything he put in the book was factual and that he spent over 100 hours interviewing the family and other witnesses, which at the time claimed that their son was, in fact, possessed. The Warrens retorted by saying that the Glatzels were trying to create media attention so that they could get more money. Uh, They maintained that everything they had said and written about the case is 100% true, and both Arnie Johnson and Debbie to this day support those claims as well. So they're on board, but I feel like they kind of have to be because they centered uh, defense around it. And I don't know if they're doing it because they truly believed it, because things went well with it for them. And so they're, they're willing to stick with that story because that's what they saw. Or I don't know. Well, I mean, they don't ever have to worry about 
being prosecuted again because no. there's a what's it called the double jeopardy clause mm-hmm. or whatnot. So yeah, you know they could literally say they were lying now, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. It's kind of weird, and I thought it was kind of douchey for like Lorraine Warren or for both of them to say, "Oh, the glasses are just trying to." make more money by making these claims blah 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 and i'm like b you just made a ton of money on a family that that you weren't even really part of i mean they were asked to do that but then you took over and made a lot of money you know what i mean so i I don't know i kind of found that really rude of her but i mean also she was being sued at the time so i can understand maybe she was just trying to defend herself and if i'm not mistaken this was one of the more high profile cases or situations i don't mean legal cases but Mm -hmm. uh demonic investigations the Warrens did in which they were there like they were there kind of throughout the whole process yeah exactly they they had a history of usually being kicked out of things yeah so as far as I know they weren't really kicked out at any point they were really there the entire time but again I don't know if that had to do anything with the fact that both the mother and the daughter were huge fans and so they just you know without being convinced to allow the Warrens to come in and being have, having that skepticism, they were they were all in. Well, and you can imagine, even though the judge had poo pooed the idea, <laughs> uh, the idea of the demonic defense, and like you said, they would try to keep the jurors, you know, away from the media and whatnot. Yeah, you can only imagine if people, even if they had just heard once who Ed and Lorraine Warren were, and they were right. like in the courtroom or they were present. They're like, oh, okay, oh, you know. this is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, so they could have totally been using them as a um, intimidation tactic, maybe, mm. against the jurors. So I'll be like, look who's in the room. So is there is there more that happened? No, that was actually the end of my story. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> it so, just kind of roughly ended. But. So I, I want to say a couple things because I want to react to this. Okay. So I didn't know the total true story. I only knew a little bit so we could talk in the podcast with Andrew. Right. So a lot of this stuff is new to me, particularly the boy possession stuff. Mm. Um, So I can also say by this point, if you've listened to this and you still haven't seen The Conjuring 3, most of this is not in the movie. So there's really not spoilers There are elements like, you know, that you can't get away from. Was there a murder? Of course, because that's how the, that's what the entire movie is based on. Based on a true murder. It's based on, (laughs) (laughs) this story was based on a true murder. (laughs) Um, the, the Conjuring has most of the movie actually has a completely different plot that so so don't worry you you shouldn't have nothing should be ruined right um, there's so much more to the movie I mean it's a horror movie trust me you'll you'll be horrified absolutely but the kid possession stuff mm-hmm. pretty darn creepy the way you described it ooh I'm the, glad you know the white eyes like how his head would sink and then do this I mean this is in like eighty one so mm-hmm. his exposure to horror concepts at least in film right. would have been so minimal compared to all i mean all the stuff that came out post 81 was a big deal so he would have only right. been able to see at this point maybe what the exorcist, the exorcist rosemary's baby yeah. just a couple things um so when everyone's claiming he levitated it's not like one person saw it yeah everyone's claiming again it. a lot of this information that i when i mentioned it is coming from either the warrens the books but this is allegedly interviews from the family. So they would have said it at some point, too. Again, this is at the beginning before um, maybe the trial started, maybe when they did, when the Glatzels realized mm-hmm. they weren't making any money. There's really no telling mm-hmm. what might have been true. They could have just been on board. And because, yeah. because what the brother was saying uh, in the lawsuit, saying, oh, um, we deserve more money because they told us that as long as we said everything they told us to say, then we'd get money. So he was in suggesting that everything was a lie just to get money. But they're like, well, no, not only were we there, you know, other family members, it did happen. So it's just like, it's a it's a hot mess. It is a hot mess. Yeah. But, and I find most of the possession stuff pretty creepy, though, yes, you could also argue everyone was in on it. So it was just like a shared lie. And yes, yeah, so I know that's possible, but with that many people, and not anyone, not not all these people saying, "Oh yeah, I was totally fake for money or or to get him court reasons or anything." Mm-hmm. That's pretty compelling. However, I wanted I, the kid stuff. I think kind of stands on its own. I agree. This was before the murder, right? And this was its own isolated thing. And the kid didn't murder anyone, mm, so they tried. The, the, yeah, I know. <laughs> but the kid thing kind of stands on its own. And that's the part I find creepy. Yeah, Arnie, however, mm. not so much. The fact that he had all these possessive moments that happened before mm-hmm. the murder like 
saying things in church or doing weird, bizarre things. If that's all true, part of me thinks that he had a premeditated reason for wanting to murder the landlord. Yeah, it didn't sound like they had the good relationship that they were trying to imply, you know, Agreed. after like during the trial and everything. Like, oh, they were witnesses said that they looked like they were having a good time earlier that day when they were having lunch. I was like, I don't know. I think him trying to get super wasted in front of kids and, you know, young people that's just like a really uh, strange characteristic to have to assume that he's a good person. Um, not saying that drinking is bad, obviously, but I'm just saying like you try not to get wasted during lunch, especially when you're driving around with children or something. Yeah, I was going to say you know? like, so let's think about this scenario. Arnie calls in sick to work. I'm mm-hmm. not necessarily saying that's a bad thing because I'm the kind of guy that, that is a fact that keeps coming up, though. Like it was. Yeah. You know, I mean, who knows? Everyone deserves a day off when they need it. And yeah. so I'm not saying that there's anything technically wrong with it. You could say ethically it's complicated. But he didn't just lie about being sick. He had all these family members, these kids over mm-hmm. to his house. And then they decided to go with the landlord to a bar to eat. Right. And I had to read this in a few places. They do go to a bar to eat. So I was like, weird. maybe it's just like a restaurant where they serve drinks. You know, that's normal. But this one's seen more specific bar where, had, where they you had food. You call it food. a bar. Like, there's just yeah. a restaurant that has a bar in it and going to a bar to eat. Yeah. So all that sounds weird. And then the landlord grabs a kid. And I'm like, there's stuff going on here that I find There's unsavory. been drama, I feel. And so there's two things that I think are happening here. Either Arnie was premeditating a murder and decided to put these seeds of mm-hmm. a past possession so that he would have That's a hell of a lot of work. But... Yeah. Or two, it could be twofold things. Arnie didn't plan on murdering him, mm-hmm. but didn't like him and murdered possibly in rage or self defense, blah blah blah. Right. But at the at the same time he was also dealing with personal issues relating towards uh the little kid possession and everything like this and maybe he was like i can worried use this he, no or he was worried he's also being possessed so he was kind of oh. dealing with that huh. and then the murder happened and he was like honestly thinking to himself you know oh man maybe this is it where there was no possession at all you know it's it's kind of like it's we were talking earlier how if someone in the family gets like flu mm-hmm. someone else will but you might be convinced you're gonna get the flu and maybe you never do but for like a couple days you feel like man my throat feels a little weird yeah, it like doesn't. it's a little itchy today and but it, yeah you're fine so yeah. what if he was already doing that and then all of a sudden this crazy thing happened like a murder he didn't plan and mm-hmm. he's able to convince himself to deal with the trauma because even if even if you're angry and you murder someone, that doesn't mean you're not going to deal with guilt or ups- being upset. As, Especially, as like, happened. yeah. And, and when I read more about Arnie Johnson, he didn't have any, like, priors. I'm not saying that that's, like, a definitive, like, characteristic of, like, why would someone murder? There's plenty of people who murdered once and then that's it, you know. But he wasn't considered as violent. And, you know, people that knew him said he just seemed very, like, mild-mannered. wasn't really a big deal. So this entire situation was out of nowhere for a lot of people, too. Who knows? I Was he possessed? Maybe. But it seems like his possession was less severe than what David was going through as well. And then it just suddenly kind of left. It doesn't sound like any exorcism was performed on Arnie Johnson. So did the demon was like, I ain't going to jail and then left or something? Like, <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't know. And, and that's where, to me, the story is interesting because I do believe, and the little kid was David, right? You know how bad I'm with names. David, yeah. That's the one I'm willing to go. There's something weird here. Mm-hmm. I, I want to know more about that story. I'm not saying he was possessed, but that's the one where I'm like, all right, there's a story here I want to hear about. Arnie, though, I'm like, yeah. mm, right. you just stabbed your landlord. That's what happened. Yeah, <laughs> like, and then now you're good, and you went to college, kind of. So, yeah, yeah I, that just, it, and, I mean, it'd be very hard to be that functional if you were possessed. Most of you guys haven't seen his hair. Uh, I'm going to (laughs) try for our Instagram post for the episode. I'm going to try to put a picture where you see his hair. Um, that's I described the true it, crime. I described it to my friend Andrew <laughs> as a racer head hair. Oh yeah, that's right. Because it's weird and it's crazy. And I kind of look at him and I'm like, if someone if someone showed me this picture and they're like, did this guy run an ice cream truck or stab his <laughs> landlord? I'd be like, stabbed his landlord. Stabbed the landlord. Definitely a stabber hair. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That was some stabby hair. <laughs> Uh, so yeah that is the end of my story there's no place to visit i can't say would you go 
here or anything like sometimes i i ask at the end but well, i don't know if i want to go to a town that's only had one murder because i'm worried something else is going on there were you gonna accidentally murder someone no i just i i love the idea of a place where murders don't happen don't get me wrong yeah but like <laughs> we live in albuquerque where murders happen every day sure and so a place where murder doesn't happen, I'm like, so what else is going on? It's like when you see those movies of like these perfect towns and then as things get deeper, you realize there's something like super creepy, like everyone's like an android or something <laughs> like that is happening and it's really bizarre. All realistic concerns totally. for sure. Um, <laughs> so when I hear a place like that, I'm just like, I'm worried the town's just weird. And I don't know be. if I'd want to go there. Yeah, it's too quaint. I feel like I can't just let myself go here. But there's been a lot of haunted stuff in Connecticut. So maybe if we ever are yeah. driving through Connecticut, let's go. Visit we can some just of these do places. yeah, spend spend a day or two just popping between a bunch of haunted places. Yeah, I think that sounds like fun. See let's... if we see if we feel like stabbing things. <laughs> oh God, let's hope not. Wasn't wasn't the movie a Haunting in Connecticut? Isn't that the one where there was like bodies in the wall and stuff like that? Yeah, that was another horror movie. I don't know much about that. I if it was based on what true story or anything. Well maybe you got a future episode somewhere in there. I I'd I have like plenty. There's so many out there, man. It's always I think the hard part about me choosing a story isn't you know, looking for one. It's eliminating possibilities. It's it's hard to filter sometimes. Anyway. So, yeah, I think we should probably take a break. Yeah, because I got, I got a little short thing. Uh, to, yeah. to tell me about, so I'm excited. So, yeah, we'll see you guys in a few. Okay, we're back, and I have another cup of coffee, so I think I'm ready to hear your story. Yay. So, today, we've got a bit of an end of episode encounter. Counter, counter. Now, if you all remember... Before last week's episode, I got sent some videos by a couple friends. So a big thank you to both Sean and Lisa for the videos. Mm. Um, I mean, they didn't make the videos, but they found them and thought we'd be interested in them. Okay. <laughs> so what made these two video submissions particularly interesting, though, is that even though they were different videos from different people who live in different states from each other uh-huh. and you know obviously weren't contacting... They were about the exact same thing. So that was a little trip to me where I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. They were both videos of Foo Fighters. Now, I assume many of you are understandably picturing the famous band of the same name. But that band actually took their name from a Mm -hmm. known phenomena called Foo Fighters. And so we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to meet. I'm going to show Lily the videos. If you want to see the videos, they are posted on our Instagram. I will also try to post them. Are they already posted? No. We'll just put it. (laughs) we'll, We'll put it as you know, scroll to the right. By the time you listen to this, it will be posted. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the videos that you're going to see on Instagram are going to be abbreviated. Like, I had to make them short for Instagram. Oh, sure. But on Facebook and Twitter, I'll have links to the long versions. Cool. Um, But anyway, so uh, let's talk about Foo Fighters. So Mm -hmm. the phenomenon has been reported in a formal capacity since November of 1944, and the term Foo Fighter was coined by the 415th Night Fighter Squadron. They were an Army Air Force unit, as the Air Force hadn't really separated into its own branch yet. And before I continue, I want to mention that the 415th Night Fighter Squadron still exists, only it's Mm. now known as the 415th Special Ops Squadron, and they are stationed right here in Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base, Ooh, which awesome. is pretty cool. So just, I mean, it's not relevant that they, I mean, <laughs> but that's a cool fun fact for us. Yeah. Anyway, so during World War II, many pilots, and I do mean many pilots, regularly saw unexplained lights or balls of light in the mm-hmm. sky that moved in bizarre ways. These lights were often changing their brightness and sometimes disappearing completely, only to reappear a short while later. The most bizarre aspects about them, however, is that they would often be moving at high speeds only to instantly change their trajectory Mm. and speed. Pilots were obviously confused by these. Lots of explanations have been given out. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we're talking about things that are moving fast in one direction, changing the direction. Like, nothing did that. And we're still pretty early in aviation by this point. Mm Hasn't even been around, like, 50 years yet for the most part. Yeah. So, anyway... The legend surrounding the origin of the term came from a mission debriefing on November 27th, 1944. In the report, it was discussed how two of the pilots witnessed a large red fireball that was chasing them and matching their high-speed maneuvers. Mm. 
Radar operator Donald Myers then slammed down a comic strip on the table and said, quote, it was another one of those fucking Foo Fighters, end quote. He borrowed the nonsense word foo from the comic strip in question that he slammed down, which was called Smokey Stover, of which he was a fan, okay. which used that word, foo, the, un- foo, the nonsense word, regularly. Okay. Many people originally assumed these were new German aircraft or weapons of war. And this was. That would have been terrifying when, like, um, right? our enemy is like a badass and that's terrifying or something you know well when you think about it war itself had had so many developments over the last 50 years like people yeah. were seeing new things all the time I yeah mean, it wasn't I, if, I mean that's where all the resources are going is for advancing in that I mean, exactly that makes sense. i mean at this time the germans were developing their v2 rockets mm-hmm. so that they could launch explosives into other cities they even launched several of their rockets into like london they just couldn't aim them very well yet right. and <laughs> And there was uh, the people were working on uh, on jet fighters, uh, which would appear just after the war and mm. things like that. I mean, all this That's new true. stuff. So this idea that it was new German weapons of war was a leading theory, and it was published in newspapers all over at the time because yeah. people were seeing this stuff, thinking it was weird. I mean, if you even Google search Foo Fighters, you're going to see like pictures and models and renditions of what people thought these German aircrafts looked like, like That's weird so things, cool. which were kind of like. It's like a retro aesthetic. You'll see like a World War II <laughs> German looking UFO and you're like, okay, that's weird. Yeah, I kind of want to see this now. It's, it's pretty neat. <laughs> no evidence or shall I say publicly released evidence exists to back this theory up. But there are quite a few people on the internet who still think this is true and suggest top secret US developments, uh, technology developments are based on captured technology from the war. The idea is if Germany did actually have these weapons of war, it was never a publicly released thing and that this was captured and kept under wraps. Another suggestion, which we have heard a lot on this show for Mm -hmm. a lot of different things, is that it was ball lightning. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, right? It's <laughs> Every ball time. Light, ball lightning is to UFOs what orbs are to ghosts. ghosts. Yeah. yeah. So ball lightning is allegedly a super rare phenomena, but with how often we hear it as an explanation, you'd think it was one of the most common things to occur. Yeah. Because apparently ball Every lightning's time. everywhere. It, it, it does seem to be a very common thing to explain. I have a hard time believing that so many pilots were seeing ball lightning in the war. and, and Yeah. Yeah. What was going on here? The U.S. military also suggested in a uh, report or research report right around the end of World War II that these sightings might just be the pilots who were flying at night. They were suffering from artifacts of aviators vertigo. Oh. Because there were other things that they were experiencing that were explained by vertigo and they're thinking, oh, maybe this was an artifact of it. However... The reason that suggestion is is a little bit problematic is that people have been spotting these Foo Fighters ever since all over the world at all times of day. Mm. But most importantly, most of them now are being seen from people on the ground. Oh. So you don't have aviators yeah. vertigo, which they were <laughs> explaining is something that happens at <gasps> night with pilots if you're seeing it during the day and you're on the ground. Okay, I have gotten vertigo. Random times. Well, but, it, but I, I but don't know I, the specifics I know what you're of aviators saying. vertigo, but I think it has to do with yeah. doing high speed maneuvers and you can't see where the ground is, and right. so you kind of lose your complete balance and everything yeah. like that. Whereas <laughs> when you get vertigo walking, you're just like, <laughs> "What is happening?" I'm a little hungover. I have a drink, <laughs> or maybe I'm a little drunk. Who knows? So both the links that were sent were Reddit posts with videos. And mm. if you just look at all the replies to these posts, it's full of people who have seen things almost exactly, if not exactly like oh, wow. in these videos. Most of the replies are saying that they don't know what they are, but they clearly remember seeing it. So it's not a bunch of people saying UFOs, UFOs. It's a bunch of people who are like, yeah, I saw this. I thought it was weird. I saw it like 10 years ago. One guy's like, yeah, when I was in Afghanistan, like fighting uh, in the military, he's like, sometimes at night when we were just out there, we'd look up in the sky and we would see this stuff. What the hell? And they'd be like, we thought maybe it was like US drones. But then when we'd go back to base, they'd be like, yeah, they don't know what it is. (laughs) They're like, we saw it too. Don't worry. So it's this thing that it, people don't seem alarmed by him. It seems like well, they don't, they haven't done anything. Yeah. So yeah, just you know, the concept of it is terrifying. But when you're like at war and someone's literally trying to shoot at you, you're like, 
that is the least of my fucking problems. Like I, I'm not, ta- I'm not scared of these lights. I'm, you know, afraid of other things right now no, or absolutely. concerned. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And that's, that I think is so important because it's not a bunch of people going, Oh my God, they're all UFOs. Everything's crazy. Like these people are yeah. like, I wonder what that is. In <laughs> fact, when Lisa sent it to me, her video, she said, do you have any idea what this is? Cause my friend saw something exactly like this and they want to know what it is. Mm. And I'm like, yeah. So she's has a friend who's seen it. I've never seen these with my own eyes. I've seen a lot of videos of them, though, so I'm, ra- I'm so waiting I'm for the time I see one. I'm wondering if the same thing I saw one time when my family and I were on a road trip. I remember we were outside of a restaurant, like just something like Burger King. Well, we never went to Burger King, like something crappy like that. And we were eating outside, and I remember looking up. I was kind of like alone, like my family was in the truck or like hanging out or talking. And convenience. Convenience. <laughs> and I was just looking, I was a little kid. And I saw these like tiny little lights and the way they were moving looked really weird to me. And at first I thought it was a helicopter, just the way it was like, I don't want to call like helicopters or anything like that, like a drunk moth compared to a plane that's very linear. But you know, a a helicopter can move, can turn a lot quicker, can do all these things. That's all I'm saying. And so I was like, that's a weird looking helicopter, but it was kind of just a ball. And then it like kind of shot up and left. And I'm like, well, that wasn't a helicopter. Yeah, helicopters aren't, they don't speed up that fast no they don't and and i that was the only thing that i could compare it to granted i was a little kid but that is my one ufo story if you even want to call it that so i i'm curious that if to see this video which i have not seen if it's even close to what i saw or maybe i was just a dumb kid who knows so i'm about to show you the video um both these videos you know obviously since they're just random videos and they have all the telltale signs that these are foo fighters that we're that we're looking at The first video is shot during the day and is allegedly taken from someone on the ground and it's somewhere in Ecuador. They're definitely not speaking English. Okay, (laughs) that's okay. You're right. (laughs) Um, Although the cameraman's framing ability leaves a lot to be desired. Oh, geez. He captures enough (laughs) to show a ball of light changing in intensity and traveling through the sky. At times, it seems to disappear, only to reappear clear as day, and halfway through the video, it changes directions completely. It's an overcast day, so the bright object is clearly visible as it goes through the sky. So I'm going to show you the video now, and then we're going to keep talking about it. Cool, cool. All right. Okay. So there's a lot to talk about, but before before what? we do, the one word I kept picking out when they were saying, and I just need you to remind me what it means. They kept saying estrella. A star. It means star. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember. I knew it had something to do with like up in the sky, but I couldn't remember. So yeah, you hear them say star a lot. Yeah. So from what I saw, it's definitely super creepy because it, it doesn't look like anything correct i can't explain it like i don't know if it's the camera that's the way it's capturing Mm. um the way it's reflecting light or whatever it is but it looks almost ethereal like it's a ball but not like a solid ball Uh and And you're getting the clouds pretty clear so it's weird at the very beginning of the video you see this this ball kind of out of focus but then I mean, I don't know if you could ever say it's in focus because you don't know what it is. Right. Yeah. And, and whatever it's it's we're receiving through video, sometimes it looked like it was getting brighter slightly and, and, and then, then less. And like something capturing a reflection. Of almost light. like a reflection. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so it, it's almost like it's I know it's not weird, but like it's an invisible thing. And then every once in a while it captures light. Mm-hmm. But that wouldn't make any sense. It makes it not invisible anymore. But yeah, like you can't see what what it actually is. So at the beginning of the video, it's moving towards the upper right of the camera screen, mm-hmm. the camera capture. It disappears. And then when it reappears, it's moving almost in the exact opposite direction going back into the left. So it's hard to tell how fast it's going. Because the way he moves his camera. Yeah, yeah. you can't tell how far away it is. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell how fast it's moving. So there's a lot of doubt here. And all I want to say is, and not to sound like you know, I'm being pessimistic or too skeptical. There is a possibility because we don't know how big or far away it is. This is a drone. Well, yeah. And, you know, we do see the. I know we can't decide how far it is, but we definitely know it's not beyond the clouds. And and a drone far enough away might appear to be a ball, especially if it's at different angles as it's hovering around is capturing light reflection then maybe what we're seeing is as it's just changing angles we're seeing light reflection and a drone does have the ability to stop quickly yeah and move fast but that all that depends on it being pretty far away and not a very big object that's just capturing light 
That's not a perfect solution, though. It is weird looking. It's a bizarre video. It does creep me out a bit. I'm gonna say. Oh yeah, it just because it, it that's just not ball lightning. It does look weird. It it's is not, not a ball, ball lightning. lightning. Okay, that is one thing that I'm sure of. It is not <laughs> ball lightning. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first video. You guys should totally check it out. And then the second video, this one was sent to me by Sean. Uh, this one's actually a couple years old, but it okay. did recently pop up on Reddit. It's a night vision video that was taken mm. on some random night during January 2018. I can't guarantee where the video was taken because the YouTube description gives me no information about that. Of course. But the YouTube username is DutchFly61. <laughs> So maybe if he is Dutch, maybe. it could be in the Netherlands, or he could just be a Dutch person somewhere else, or someone who just loves the Dutch. Sure. I, I could be something. So I'm going to say maybe Netherlands, maybe not. Netherlands it is. But what makes this video really exciting is that this one actually has context. So he's looking up at the night sky and you see stars. But... The video is long enough that he actually captures other things and labels them in the video so you can see reference. Oh, that's cool. Like, he catches a flock of birds in a flight pattern, points them out, these are birds. Mm -hmm. Then he captures an aircraft. You can see it's got that very recognizable kind of flashing light. Like blinking, yeah. And he even sees two satellites and points them out, these are satellites. So you now have a reference for actual things in the same video. And then all of a sudden, you see the weird thing it's moving it's a mysterious light moving rapidly down through the view it looks different than all the other lights it moves differently it looks differently it's everything about it's different and then at one point it just pretty much stops and then instantly changes direction and moves super fast like it had before it's like bye it doesn't move like anything else here it's super cool let's see it so i'm gonna show you this video that one gave me goosebumps. <laughs> so now that you've seen it. Oh my God. Uh, that one actually, I don't know why. That one gave me goosebumps. It like looks I really weird, doesn't it? That is exactly what I fucking saw. That's textbook Foo yeah. Fighter. So I saw Foo Fighter. Actually, there was two because there was the one and then the second one looked like it appeared. But this one, yeah, it's just the one, the same. Uh, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> so is it making you think a little bit more about your what you no. saw earlier as a kid? Yeah, well, now I'm just like even more scared, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> You've never told me about this. You said you saw something once, but you never described it. So this is my first time hearing about it. I know. I, I guess I, I just don't know what, what it was. What other secrets do you have for our marriage? I know. <laughs> what else are you hiding from me? No, I... I guess like when I think about it, and, and it's something I don't really tell because I never had a way to describe it otherwise, and it just sounds so like... Oh, it could have been anything. But the fact that you have now a name for it. I mean, I didn't really know what a Foo Fighter was before the band. So, you know, now that I have a better understanding of what it could be, I'm not alone. I'm more comfortable sharing it, I suppose. Well, and no one can walk around with a shirt about the UFOs calling Foo Fighters. (laughs) Everyone's just going to assume you're really into the band. Yeah. Now we have to make a shirt. I think, But hopefully we don't get sued. So who knows? (laughs) Most people hear Foo Fighters are just going to think Yeah, like exactly. And that's fine. And, well, they're definitely more popular. I think they've uh, well, yeah, I think earned it was the an, name, a, too. An uncommon term. It so. is, yeah. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, one of their album covers has that weird German UFO thing on it. Oh, my God. Are you serious? I think so. That sounds familiar because my sister had uh, their, like, huge album in the early 90s, and I mm-hmm. used to go and steal her CDs because I was a little asshole little kid, like sure. most, most Classic, younger young brothers sibling, are. yeah. Um, I stole a lot of albums. That's how I just. Dis- <laughs> that's, that's that's how I discovered. I mean, I would steal her Ace of Base. I would steal her Foo Fighters. Awesome. I stole her. I mean, you can steal what only we can get. Smashing so. Pumpkins. Nice. Yeah, I stole it all. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think there was only one CD I stole from her I didn't like, and that was a Duran Duran Greatest Hits. And I found out that the band's just not for me. You're like not worth the steal. Totally yeah. not worth it. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna go back and steal Alice in Chains now. <laughs> All right, so I don't think this one's a drone, though, the, the last video. I don't think so either. Uh, because we have a context and a scale yeah. for everything else in the video. This, you know, you it just doesn't look like a drone. It doesn't behave like a drone. Why is it there? What's it doing? It's just weird. The first one, yeah, I'm not sure. The second one, I'm like, like I said, totally scared. Mm. Just because I, you know, it definitely unlocked old memories. And yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm over here like freaking out, but I love it. 
So are these are these lights, these Foo Fighters, alien spacecrafts? Are they super secret technology from the U.S. government or other mm. governments? So at some point in the future, I might do a more in-depth discussion on Foo Fighters. But until then, yes, this has been your end of episode encounter. Definitely one of my favorites. Love it. And I do stress, you guys need to watch the videos or else this last end of episode segment is going to be really lame. Just a little more, con- not confusing, but I guess you can visualize it. We, you, had, you did a pretty good description, but I think it's totally worth watching the videos. I highly recommend it. It's 100% going to be on the Instagram. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to get it posted on the Instagram before we post this episode title. So I like how you see. say on the Instagram. On the grams. On the grams. Okay. <laughs> It'll be on the Instagram, the one and only. Yeah, there's not multiple. Not that I know of. Awesome. So thank you guys for listening. I really hope that you had a really good time. I had an amazing time uh, researching my story, especially since after we saw the movie, I was a lot more inspired and uh, and definitely happy that Lisa and both Lisa and Sean sent you those videos because now I got to see a true childhood fear that I've had always in my heart. <laughs> so anyway, um, if you guys are listening to this while you guys had been imbibing the night before or just had a really tough week like us and are currently trying trying to listen to this episode to feel better well that's okay because like we always say that the best cure for a hangover is fear bye